I said it to you once, I'll say it again. You are as tough as they come, Rebecca Pearson. It makes me emotional to think about, to tell her that she was okay, an incredible mother and did such a good job because he was there at the start of it. That's the part of the script that like really got me. And I was so moved by him being the person to like, to tell her that, to tell her that she did a good job. I'm Mandy Moore. I'm Ken Olin. I'm one of the executive producers and directors. And this is Variety's Making a Scene. Be with you in just a second, dear. Knowing that I was going to be on set with Ken for these last two episodes and for the train in particular, it was like, oh, I know I'm in the best hands possible. So we really did discuss it beforehand to make sure that we were on the same page because again, like everyone's interpretation of the afterlife or making this transition in life, like everyone's going to come to it from a different place. And I wanted to make sure that we were very much aligned. The idea that she was going to play herself in a, in a state of mind to some extent was really challenging. And, and, and Mandy and I worked together really closely for, for six years, but, you know, Mandy and I were going, okay, so this is different than what we've done. And we both got to the point where I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't know. And I, I finally said to Mandy, and, and thank God she trusts me because, but uh, I said, you know, Mandy, I, I actually, I, I don't know, but I think you and I will find it. I mean, we'll find it. We'll know when we're there. He also was understanding that as a human being, that maybe the first take was going to be slightly more emotional, like listening to Gerald McCraney regale me with those beautiful words or seeing Ron for the first time and, and sharing that scene with him. It was going to hit me like as a human being and to kind of allow myself the grace to like hear it and feel it, kind of get it out of my system and then have a little bit more like mobility to play around with where we wanted to go ultimately. and. Um, I knew that we could get there together. Your kids grew up beautifully. <laughs> Dan Vogelman began to develop the idea of using something early in the season about a caboose and knowing that what we were going to eventually get to was it was the last car. So that became a metaphor for the end of her life. As emotionally grounded as we wanted to be and intimate as we wanted to be, it also allowed us the opportunity to elevate it and to take it to a place that wasn't just grim or sad, but that there was an aspect of a journey. And it's not a journey that, that necessarily ends at the end of one person's life. Limoncello, or is that too on the nose? Hey, if life gives you lemons. <laughs> Actually, could you make me a Vesper? Coming right up. <laughs> I think one of the things that makes the bar scene so special is that there are so many layers and so much history that preceded it. There were so many props to take in and I really had like a moment in the scene to like really see everything and and absorb it all. I think seeing the the piece of the wall from the Pearson household with like the kids height, like over the years was something I really clocked and was like, oof. There's lemons, there's a froggy's bar napkin. I mean, all the Kevins were playing with the camera, the Jack's video camera. And then this Randall's were working on the jigsaw puzzle. There was just lots of little things to sort of clock that helped me kind of sink into that moment. You know, it was very important to me not to dwell on certain things and become very self-referential. It was meant to be experienced more as observed rather than any sort of celebration of how fabulous we had been for six years. There's nothing left to do. You trust the process and you drink a Vesper. Gerald becomes so prepared and so relaxed, so confident that he knows always how to modulate his performance so that he not only accomplishes what the intentions of the writer are, he elevates it. He, he, he goes beyond that. He never goes for sentiment. He understands what's, 
what's being asked of him so he can take you right there. That scene is imbued with so much feeling and so much history, and yet he never loses sight of what is natural, what is real. I love Mac. He loves to go by Mac, Gerald McCraney. I just have felt this intrinsic connection with him, like from the jump of the show and whatever it was going to unfold and be. And, you know, and then Mandy, who she just is so brilliantly available and she just falls right into her with him. What a thing you made of it all. What a big, messy, gigantic, spectacular thing. I just thought it was so fitting that he was there to sort of usher her into this next chapter of her life and also was the one to give her permission to sort of move forward. It's the first time she's really clocking like, oh, this is, this is ultimately going to end. And I know where this is leading. Ugh. It makes me emotional to think about, to tell her that she was Okay, an incredible mother and did such a good job because he was there at the start of it. That's the part of the script that like really got me. And I was so moved by him being the person to like, to tell her that, to tell her that she did a good job. I just, I love that. Sorry. <laughs> Ooh. Thank you for being my doctor. Yeah, I was only your doctor that one time. It was a big one, though. Yes, it was. One of the secrets of the show from the beginning was that for Dan Fogelman, this show was really about Rebecca. And for the first couple of years, because of how brilliant Milo is and because of the way that the show is structured, it seemed to be a lot about Jack. And the thing about Mandy, she has this incredible professionalism. She started out very young as a, as a singer and a performer. So she has this kind of discipline, this extraordinary discipline. She's younger than all three of them in life. She plays their mother and you're never taken out of the show. I mean, she's got four hours of makeup. She, and I said, this so is I think she's a savant. I don't know. I'm, I'm <laughs> a big fan of Mandy. I knew this was the end. I knew obviously this was the episode that Rebecca was going to pass away. I knew that there was this idea of the train and it was linked to the caboose, which is a word in a book and a, a very visceral memory for Rebecca that she has trouble with. So I remember settling in with my script and I was in bed and I showered, put my baby down. I was like, here we go. Like it was, it was like, I think page four, I was already starting to really get emotional like so much so that my husband was like are you okay it's like what's going on I was like I'm reading you know like the end of this character as soon as I finished the script I got sick which is true I've never had that reaction I guess like you know if you are so overcome with emotion sometimes that's your body's response and I think that was just my response I was like this is the end and it was just I couldn't help myself if something makes you sad when it ends, it must have been pretty wonderful when it was happening. Truth be told, I've always felt it a bit lazy to just think of the world as sad, because so much of it is. Because everything ends, everything dies. That message that Ron delivers at the end, of, that's, I think, the message of the show. So you need it to be done with the appropriate amount of gravitas, both Dan and myself. If there's anything that we're a little bit allergic to, it's self-seriousness. How do you do that in a way that feels honest and feels truthful and feels sincere? It doesn't feel pompous. And there's nothing about Ron Cephas Jones that's pompous. Anything he could say probably have just read something from the phone book but if he does it in that way you just know that it's it, it matters emotionally there's something about it that is really beautiful it felt like oh take it from someone who's who's been here who's experienced this like 
trust me on, on this. And it felt very reassuring in a moment where there was a lot of apprehension, I think, on Rebecca's part. Like just taking that final step was terrifying, even though she knew she had to. It's like that last moment before you take the leap off the cliff of, am I going to land safely? Like, is this okay? What am I getting myself into? And I, I think for him to sort of reassure her, like, look at the bigger picture of your life. Like, this is, this is what it's all kind of been leading to. And it's okay. I, I loved that he was the one to sort of tell her that. Hey, Mom. It's me. It's Buck. I'm here. I'm here. I walked into the experience knowing this is definitely going to be challenging, but I get to be made up. And then I get to lie in bed all day and listen to my friends who are the most incredible actors, like say these beautiful lines and say goodbye to this character. And I just, I was so excited for this treat. And then the first scene up was Susan who plays Beth and thank goodness they set up the cameras on her first because she jumped into this monologue and just devastated me. And I'm obviously, my eyes are closed. My breathing is a little just like, you know, shallow. It's, it, we're coming to the end of this woman's life. So obviously like, I'm not super present. <laughs> the camera wasn't on me, thank God, because there was like just tears streaming down my face. And I was like, How? I can't listen. So I like really had to try to train myself to go somewhere in the deep recesses of my imagination, like floating in the middle of the ocean with a cocktail, like listening to some great music and the sun was shining. Like I really had to try to put myself somewhere else because it was um, a lot harder than I think I realized. I didn't really think about my part of, of mimicking where we were three years ago for the scene that opens up the final episode of the show. I knew that that's what, what, what Ken and Yasu, our DP, were sort of aiming to, to mimic. We were echoing the scene that had been shot in the uh, last episode uh, of the two of them in bed. We shot that about three years ago. It was always intended to, to mirror that scene. I think the reason I shot that scene the way I did three and a half years ago is I wanted it to feel as intimate and private as possible. Miss that little scarf. Come on, you didn't even notice it for over a decade. I was too busy looking at the rest of the face. And thank goodness for Milo, because the shot was so tight, like on our faces, he would like keep flipping the pillow over because there would be little tear stains on it. <laughs> and he like had this like tissue ball behind the pillow for me to like help me sop up my tears in between takes and then rearrange the pillow. And then I used his pillow at one point and like switched with him when it was on my coverage. We did good. You did so good. The wish fulfillment, I think, ultimately in the show was that, you know, there are, they belong together. And even though it was cut so short in their life, at the end, you know, they were meant to be. And as much as we all want success, maybe at the end of the day, more than anything, we all want to live a love story. Whatever that is, you know, if it's with a partner, if it's with your children, if it's with whatever it is, you know, that's the thing. If you want a love story. And... That's what this is us. Ultimately, that's what it is. That's what it was. And that love story was Jack and Rebecca's. That's where it began and that's where it ended. Mm -hmm.